So this is the base 14 inch M3 Pro MacBook Pro. I've now spent six months with this machine incorporated into my daily workflow. So today I'll be speaking on what it's actually like to use each day. This should help those of you looking at picking up a new MacBook, spend your money wisely. Now I got this base bundle config, which retails for $19.99, mainly as a review unit for this channel. As coming from a 16 inch M1 Pro, I wanted to try out this smaller size and see if Apple had made any reasonable updates two gens later. With these now seemingly yearly Mac updates, you can't expect to see much of a tangible improvement, but in some ways, this is actually a downgrade from the M2. This M3 Pro chip has an 11 core CPU made up of five performance cores and six efficiency cores. From the M2 Pro, there is an extra core, but the makeup previously was six performance cores and four efficiency cores. Synthetic benchmarks don't say much because it is so dependent dependent on what sort of work you do, but single core performance saw a 17% increase in Geekbench, while multi-core performance saw a 14% increase. On the GPU side, we lost two cores compared to the M2 Pro, now having just 14 in this base config. Though there was the addition of hardware accelerated ray tracing, which in the right scenario could bring a benefit. If you use Blender, for example, you'd maybe notice an improvement, but if you're just editing, this is not something to give any thought to. The base amount of RAM is a bit higher now at 18 gigabytes, but I never noticed that making much of a difference. It wasn't until I began using this laptop more and more that I realized just how important RAM actually is. To preface, the heaviest of my workload is video editing, which to be honest isn't anything crazy. I edit on a 4K timeline with a couple layers of H.264 footage, along with some music and color corrections. That said, I find that pretty often when I'm editing in Resolve, I'll get lag spikes that last multiple seconds at a time, which make it harder to get in the flow and quickly edit these videos. Something worth noting is on the M3 Pro, the memory bandwidth is 150 gigabytes per second, which is 50 less than the previous gen, and even on the max, it's 300 compared to 400 gigabytes per second. I still think the amount of RAM has more to do with my lag, but I never really found out the reason that Apple lowered this. Aside from those occasional spikes, this laptop day-to-day -day handles everything I throw at it well. In my initial review, View, I had mentioned that my Resolve export times between the M1 and M3 Pro were exactly the same, and this was to be expected as they both use the same media engine with one encoder and one decoder. The Max chip has two of each, which would bring a bigger improvement, but even with this, it only takes 10 minutes on average for my videos to export, meanwhile I can handle other work. So the internal SSD on this base model is only 512GB, which I'm pretty close to maxing with about 70GB remaining so that is a big thing I wish I upgraded. I don't think you should spend a ton of money on storage because of Apple's insane prices, but the lower storage devices are slower than the higher ones. Compared to the 1TB drive in my M1 Pro, this is about 20% slower in both read and write speeds. For admin work and other light tasks, this isn't going to be an issue, but once you start video editing or even just transferring a lot of files, this is something that becomes important. For me, I've been fine with this amount of storage as I use an SSD enclosure from ROG that I put a 4TB M.2 drive inside. This is where I keep all of my video footage for the last couple of months worth of uploads. I'm still considering investing in a NAS or just using cloud storage to have a safe and more accessible solution. Now onto this aluminum chassis, I have it in this space black finish and I've only come to enjoy this more and more with time. Fingerprints are noticeable so I'd keep a microfiber cloth nearby, but it's not as bad as you'd expect. This color is a lot darker than space gray, though if you have it under a light, it will shift significantly. I do really hope they keep this finish around because I love the dark vibe and how it goes along with all of my everyday carry items. So this 14 inch size is small, which I love for travel, but compared to the M3 MacBook Air for example, it's noticeably heavier at 3.5 pounds compared to 2.7. I don't really think this is a heavy laptop though, and I would much rather carry an extra pound to have the display and power of this machine. In terms of thermals, I can't remember a single time that these fans have spun up. It will get warm every now and again when deep into edits, but in my experience, thermals just aren't something you really need to worry about. Over the last few years, I've used my Mac docked over 80% of the time, but recently I've been working right off of this display, using my ultrawide as a second monitor. I don't know what it is, there's just something about the MacBook's keyboard I really like. It doesn't have anywhere near the same travel as some of the high-profile keyboards I own, but 
but I love coding on here. Part of it might be that I just love looking at the MacBook's display while I type, as it's gorgeous. For this reason, it's so convenient having the SD card slot at the side. I use this every single week to edit my photos, as it's so much nicer to pop this in right out of the camera. I haven't done this recently, but occasionally I'll bring this over to my Alienware monitor at my gaming setup, as the colors are really good, and I can hook up over HDMI 2.1. When I was testing the M3 MacBook Air, the lack of this and other ports was the hardest thing to deal with, as just two USB-C ports is incredibly limiting. Now, longtime viewers will know that my M1 Pro MacBook was the 16-inch version, and I'll say that there is a benefit to it when programming, as it's really cramped if you only have this 14-inch display to go between your browser, terminal, and code editor. If, like me, you use VS Code, you can use the integrated terminal and extensions like Postman so that there's less jumping you have to do. Still though, I think that for day-to-day -day use, carrying this around is so much more practical than the 16-inch. Because I rarely work outside my office, I'm currently loving the 14-inch Mac plus ultra-wide work setup. There are a couple of drawbacks working off of this display aside from real estate though, and these are the smaller trackpad and speakers. When dragging a file across the screen, it's easy to reach the edge, though three-finger dragging does help with this. Additionally, these smaller speakers won't sound nearly as good, but I still think that all MacBooks tend to have pretty good speakers for what they are. <laughs> Now at this point, ProMotion is nothing new, but three years later, I still geek out over it. This is one of those things that you can't really appreciate until you have it because you wouldn't think it'd be that noticeable for work, but moving around your cursor in Windows feels smoother. This display has a 254 PPI pixel density and 600 nits of brightness, which is 100 nits brighter than previously, but this hasn't been all that noticeable as I never really have an issue with MacBook brightness. In HDR content, the X your brightness is 1000 nits sustained and 1600 nits at peak. With the mini LED display, the blacks are deep, which makes everything on it look gorgeous. This is especially true when I have a tab overlaid on one of my prism wallpapers, link down below. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I do tend to work with my Mac docked a lot of the time, so battery life has never been much of a concern. Quickly, if you are wondering, I use the TS4 dock from Caldigit, which I can highly recommend investing in. It has a ton of ports and keeps the laptop powered. I know that some people worry about keeping your Mac plugged in all the time, but taking a look instead settings, it's still at 100% capacity. This is with me working docked pretty much every day. The Mac is smart when it comes to handling power as it will swap sources to the power adapter and be careful to not fully charge when unneeded. There's a lot of times where I'll bring it back to the desk after hours of use and it stops once hitting 80% to prevent going through too many cycles. When that desk is at my second setup that I travel to a few times per year, I try to keep the items I bring to a minimum while still enabling me to use the external 4K monitor that I have there. While I do enjoy working right off the display, there's still times I want to use a proper keyboard and mouse setup, so slipping in this Edge keyboard from Lowfree who are sponsoring this video is something I can't wait to do this July. They designed this to be as thin as possible without sacrificing key travel. It obviously won't be on the same level as their high profile block keyboard, but they definitely deliver. This is also by far the lightest keyboard I've held, weighing just 485 grams, while still managing to feel incredibly well built. They I accomplished this with a combination of carbon fiber on the front that looks sick and a magnesium alloy body. Included within the box are these extra carbon fiber pieces that are recycled from the board that made the front plate and can be put together to create a stand for the keyboard. Looking at the bottom side, the holes make for a Mac Pro-like design that sheds off some extra weight. Flipping out the bottom feet before you place this on your desk ensures you won't scratch it up if you don't have a desk mat. Underneath the PBT keycaps are palm switches from Kel that provide 2.4 millimeters of total travel soldered onto the board's gasket mount. When connected over Bluetooth to your macOS or Windows machine, it can provide up to 130 hours of battery life, so you won't have to worry about it keeping a charge while you travel. So with all that said about the M3 Pro MacBook, in my opinion, I think it's worth saving the money and going for either the M2 or M1 Pro, as the several hundred dollars that you can save can be, for one, kept in your pocket, or go towards higher quality peripherals and or a dock. Depending on what your work consists of, the 
MacBook Air with upgraded RAM can be a great option for those of you on a budget. In real life use, the performance boosts from even the M1 Pro are pretty slim for most workflows, aside from GPU work. When video editing, this machine is pretty much just as powerful as my M1 Pro was, and in some ways, this base config is worse given its lower GPU core count and memory bandwidth. Depending on your workflow, you'll want to go up to 36 or 32 gigabytes of RAM on the M2 Pro, which would save you some money. If you plan to use the Mac with an external monitor and want to use it over HDMI, consider whether you would benefit from the 2.1 port on the M2 Pro, as the M1 only has a 2.0 port. That could be really useful if you have the right monitor, otherwise these yearly updates aren't going to be anything drastic. Honestly, I would not have upgraded if I didn't make these videos because I think MacBooks are machines meant to last you five to seven years. Let me know your thoughts down below and whether you're buying a new Mac or have had one for a little while, go and watch this video here where I talk about the best Mac apps I've found to stay productive, many of which you probably haven't heard of. Take care.